Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining today's live stream. Welcome to our second edition of the live coding sessions that we're holding. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, today, we've got a really fascinating session, something that I'm sure you're really going to enjoy. Uh, we are going to be implementing a compiler for the Piet language from scratch in the Go language. Now, this is going to be really interesting, and we'll get into what that is in a moment, but I'm joined by my friend Omer, uh, Omer Kamal. So, Omer, would you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Omer Kamal. I'm, uh, um, I work at IBM as a software development, and Tammy is one of my colleagues. Wonderful. All right, so thank you very much, Omer, and let's get started. So, here's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be taking something called an esoteric programming language, and this one's called PIA, and we're going to be implementing a compiler for it. Now, an esoteric programming language, just so that you're aware, is a programming language that doesn't necessarily have a particular use to it, so it's not practical, it's not something that you would use in your everyday programming life, but it's something that you would use as, as sort of like an expression of code or, or, or to, to, to have fun with code in a way. Um, Piet is one of those languages, it's actually one of the most well-known esoteric programming languages, and it enables you to write code with art. It enables you to write code with images. Uh, it's a really fascinating programming language, and I feel like it would be great for me to actually show you what I mean. Uh, and then we'll get into why we're writing a compiler for this in just a moment as well. So really quickly, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with all of you, uh, as well as with Omer. So there we go. Everybody should be able to see my screen now. And of course, Zoom wants my password. Isn't that great? OK, so now you should be able to see my screen and the two of us. All right. Um, so, so what you're seeing right here is something called a Master Pete's IDE. Uh, it's an IDE for the PEAT programming language. Uh, and, and really quickly before we begin, I just want to show you what the PEAT programming language is like. Now, PEAT is stack-based, so that means there's no concept of a, of a variable or a constant or a register. All of your operations just happen on a single stack. Uh, now, there is no definitive proof that PEAT is, is, is Turing complete. Uh, however, people were able to implement a, an interpreter for another Turing complete language within PEAT, so that means PEAT must be Turing complete um, in, an, in and of itself. So, so that's really interesting. That means you can do a lot of stuff with Piet. Um, so, so in order to sort of get, get the hang of what Piet enables you to do, how about we implement a simple program? Um, let's just say we want to print out the number 1. So over here, we've got this blank grid of pixels. And we're going to start off just by putting any color onto, onto, the, um, onto the grid. It doesn't really matter which one we put on first. But what we want to do is we want to print out a 1. So we have to somehow push a 1 to the stack. Now, if you notice over here, you can actually take a look at all the different colors and what their instructions are. So for example, this red over here, this has the instruction push. So if I click on red, and if I put down a red pixel, suddenly we've pushed a 1 to the stack. Now what you'll notice is that after I click the red, the, the actual instructions that all of these colors run have changed. Now the reason they've changed is because PS doesn't run instructions based off of the individual colors of pixels, but rather it runs instructions based off of the difference between the colors between pixels. Um, so something, so, so the actual like PS interpreter is going to start off in the top left. It's going to take a look at that color, and then it'll move over to the next codal, which is a group of pixels building up a single block. Um, and and when it moves over to the next codal, it'll calculate the difference between the two colors and based off of that difference it will run an instruction. So in this case that instruction happens to be push. Uh, and then from there what do we want to do? We have a one on the stack but we want to output it. So we're going to click the output number color and suddenly all the other instructions change and we're going to put that down. And if we go over to the debugger, this is really interesting, we should be able to run our little program. As you can see the current command is push one, output number, and in our output we see the number one. And so that is essentially how Piet works. It's a really fascinating language, and because it's stack-based, and it has a stack-based instruction set, and not like a register-based one, which is how most CPUs work, it can be a little 
mind bending um, to work with Piet, um, but it's still a really interesting language. Now, if you're wondering why this red block pushed a one to the stack, it pushed a one to the stack because there was one codal in the block before it. So, for example, if I were to put in three codals in this in this block and then move over to this color and then print it out. Uh, and if we were to run this again, it says push three and output three. So again, the way P it works is interesting and you can do a lot of really interesting stuff with it. Um, in terms of different examples of P it programs, here are just some. Uh, so this is a hello world, for example. Also, in case you were wondering, um, if you wanna print out something like hello world, then what you have to do is you have to push the Unicode value for each character on the stack, and then you output those characters. Uh, so it can it can get a little repetitive, but that's the entire point of Piet is to be able to implement um, something that that works in this complex of a fashion. Uh, and of course, if you program your things right, you can get some really pretty examples. So, for example, this artistic Hello World and this animated version of Hello World. So, really fun stuff you can do with this. Um, and here's what's really interesting. We are going to be programming this compiler in the Go language. Uh, now, if you've w been watching my channel for some time, you know that I really like programming in Swift um, because, of, because of the way it works. Uh, however, today we're going to be trying something else out. Omer's favorite programming language is Go, and it's something that I want to get into, and so we are going to be programming in the Go language. Omer, anything you want to add before we get into how our code currently works? So can we go back to the example? Yeah. So we're going to be, no, no, uh, the picture. Oh, this one? Came out. Yeah. So we're just going to assume number three uh, at the very last statement. Don't ask me how it works. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, yeah. Don't ask me how it works. I have no idea. Uh, that's kind of funny. <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no comment. I just, I just found that kind of be a little bit funny how they just implement something and have no idea. Yeah, it is, it is pretty funny. I mean, taking a look at this Tower of Hanoi, again, the entire point of Piet is that it looks nice, but it's essentially impossible for anybody to look at it and know how it works. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty fascinating example. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess we can get started with our code and, and how our things work. Uh, so, Omer, do you want to quickly sort of run through this code that we've got over here and sort of show people what it is that we're working with? Sure. So, at the very, um, this is just a simple Golang uh, program. Uh, so, this is just the main function. Are you, oh, yeah, you're in the main dot by. Go. So, under the main function, we're just going to do a simple test case. Our program is going to be push five, push five, add output n. So what we're trying to do is create a simple instruction set. And the instruction set that we detail in a comment above, and this is just some building blocks that we can use. Eventually, we might be able to create a high level language, but we want to do something simple. In this case, we want to just output 10 because five plus five, you add and you output. And what we want to do right now is uh, we want to implement all the functionality within, uh, which is required and also uh, try to render the images correctly. And to do that, we also need to do the correlation between what color to what color does what. In that example, I believe you did uh, beige, like a light uh, beige to another color and that was a push. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, and whatever the color to start with, the next block depend because that set can change by, by the color before. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So just, uh, I mean, you mentioned the instruction set, just so everybody knows, this is the instruction set that we're working with. Well, we've put together this instruction set uh, because it it's a good balance between being low level, but at the same time, enabling a little bit of high level functionality so that you're not being like push H, push E, push L, push L. You can just say push hello world. Um, and our instruction set will take care of it. And our, our little compiler will, will be able to convert that to a, um, to a program. Uh, now we've already put together a little bit of building block code, nothing really intense. I'll just quickly go through it so you understand a little bit of how it works. So in the beginning, uh, we've gone ahead and imported our, our, our packages in, in, in Go, whatever we need. Um, all the Go-specific stuff, I'll let Omer get into that in a moment. Uh, apart from that, we've defined our language specs, so all the different um, instructions that we're going to allow in our little assembly language. Uh, and then uh, just a little example to get across the syntax. 
Now, the way this assembly language is going to work is there are going to be multiple uh, things that we're going to call basic blocks, and we're taking that terminology from the LLVM world. Um, and these basic, blo basic blocks will be a set of instructions that are just run sequentially uh, with no jumps between them or anything of that sort. Um, but each basic block must end in either a unconditional jump or a conditional jump or an exit. Um, so an exit would mean the program ends, an unconditional jump just means go to a different block, uh, versus um, a conditional jump, which will take a look at the top of the stack, pop that value off. If it's a zero, uh, we're going to move to um, we're going to move to the first. Or sorry, if it's a one, then we're going to move to the first label specified. If it's a zero, then we're going to move to the second label specified. Um, and so just really quickly, we are getting a couple of questions. Uh, Omer, this one's for you, actually. Golang is a networking language. It's more related to server and web. Why are we using it in this use case? Exactly. You can use any language for any use cases. Uh, the reason we're doing Golang is to try out and see if it's possible. And it's very easy to compile and be optimized. And we can say the same thing about like Swift, like majority of people use it for iOS, but you can in theory create an application on Mac or Windows that, that you can use it for. And Go is, someone mentioned is a networking language. It, it is, but uh, Go is just meant to be for server side. So anything to do with server, you can use it. Not a lot of people really use it for web and per se like a web server. There are examples of it, but I think if, uh, there are better uh, languages for those. I think yeah. Rust might be one of the fastest uh, web browser. Not web browser, I mean uh, web server. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like a good analogy you gave actually was a Swift one. Like, a lot of people think Swift is only good for... Um, for, for, for iOS, but then it's really good actually for like server side and Linux and, and front end in some cases as well. Um, so, so that's, so I feel like that's one of the reasons we're using Go right now is because it's general purpose, even though it's mostly used for like uh, um, server side. Uh, also, another question is, are you using LLVM as backend? No, we are not. We're actually writing this from scratch. That's the interesting part. Uh, and so we've written our own little instruction set and assembly and our own intermediate representation, and we're going to be going over to PIT, which will then be interpreted by another PIT interpreter that's already been built. In the future, we may end up building our own PIT interpreter. Um, uh, and, however, uh, we will be, in this case, using our own instruction set. All right, uh, so I feel like we can get started. Now, to give you an idea of how the code we've written already works, um, I'll just quickly go through it. We're, quick, we're defining two types in the beginning, so we're defining a program, which is just a string. Um, at first, I was wondering why you would want to redefine a string as a program if it's just a type alias, uh, but Omer told me the great reason, and that is in Go, uh, you can have this little function over here that will add functionality to the program type, which is great, and I'll talk about what that function does. Uh, also, we're defining another type called an instruction validator. An instruction validator is a function that takes an array of strings and returns a boolean uh, telling us whether or not a certain instruction is valid. So, for example, what we're doing over here is we're putting together a map, so a dictionary in Swift terminology, um, of strings to instruction validators. So, for example, if we have the instruction input n, uh, then our instruction validator function, all it's going to do is check if there are exactly zero arguments. If there are any arguments, then it's going to return false, uh, because then in that case, it's an invalid instruction, because you cannot have parameters being passed to the instruction. Um, so there's a couple of instruction validators that we've already put together, and we'll put together a couple more um, in the actual uh, in the actual uh, live stream today. Uh, apart from that, we've also got an instruction structure, uh, and this instruction will contain the name of the instruction, so things like output or push or exit, and the arguments that were passed to the instruction. Um, now, I'll talk about the main function in a moment. We've also got this really interesting function called the lex function. So this does the actual lexing of the program. Lexing comes before parsing, uh, and basically what we're doing in lexing is we're sort of fuzzing the actual strict definitions of lexing and parsing here. We're putting a little bit in both. Um, but, but essentially what this is going to do is it's going to split up an entire program string into blocks of instructions based off of the basic blocks. And it's going to store the names of those basic blocks in a dictionary uh, where the value is the array of instructions within that block. Um, and one more thing that we do is we actually validate all of these instructions by calling instruction.validate. 
And when we do that, we just check if it's correct. If the instruction is not valid, then we run a panic, which, is, which would be a fatal error. Um, and we just say invalid instruction, and we end it there. Uh, we're in this, uh, actually having the compiler output valid errors is way beyond the scope of today's live stream. Um, but maybe that's something we could do in the future if you would be interested in that. We also have a validate function, which is basically just going to look up the instruction name within the instruction validators variable. Uh, and then once we have the, va the, the relevant instruction validator, we're going to call it with the arguments that were passed to the function and then just return uh, if, that's, if that's true. Uh, and of course, if the instruction doesn't exist, then we return false anyway because it's not a valid instruction if it doesn't exist. Uh, and so that is how our program works so far. Uh, of course, there is another aspect to this altogether, which is having to actually render the images themselves. Um, and so that's code that we, again, will be getting into, and I feel like Omer can do a much better job explaining this code than I can right now. Um, However, before we begin, I feel like it's important um, to sort of show you all what our logic is of how the compiler is actually going to take our assembly and convert it to P at code. So let's quickly go through that. Um, and I feel like it would be important for us to, to first of all, understand one more thing about PIT. And that is that, of course, it starts off in the top left corner and then goes to the right and then goes down and then goes back left and then goes back up in terms of uh, how it um, moves from codal to codal, which is code pixel. Um, however, what you could do is if you wanted it, if you wanted to force it to turn early, uh, you can always, let's see over here, you can always take this sort of like black, um, uh, this black color, and you can put it over here. And when uh, when the Piet interpreter hits that black block, it's going to be like, oh, I can't move into black. So let's try tr let's try turning. And when it turns down, it'll be able to continue if we actually put some instructions here. Now, if we wanted to print something, remember Piet works off of the difference between colors, and white does nothing. It's just sort of blank. It allows the interpreter to move. Um, so we need to put down some sample color just to begin with, so that we have a diff for the next color. Color so we can actually output the number. Uh, and so in theory, this should be valid P at code. Let's see. So we push three. What do we do next? Yep. Then we output the number and then we end up printing three. And so, uh, and so this is a, this is a pretty, pretty interesting way of, of getting, um, getting the P at interpreter to understand your code. And so here's the idea of how we're actually going to implement uh, the Piet compiler. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can resize. No, can I not? I've got to refresh. All right, so I'm going to resize this to a 30 by 30 board. And by default, our compiler is going to make it so that the background is completely black. That means that the interpreter is only going to move where we tell it to move or where we explicitly cave out a path for it. Um, so that, that makes, first of all, things a lot easier if the background is black. Uh, but then from there, we have to have these basic blocks represented within the program. Uh, and so let's just say we had um, this simple program over here where we've got these four different basic blocks. Basically, the idea is that in today's live stream, all we want to do is render these individual basic blocks correctly. If we get enough time to actually implement the wiring between them, that would be great but I'm not sure if, if uh, we would have enough time to finish that today since we do want to keep this um, short so that you can actually rewatch this easily. And so, um, and so the way that we would implement these basic blocks would be, for example, with main, we would start off with what I like to call like a wiring color, so just like a sort of um, initial color because there has to be some starting color. And then we're going to put down the colors for all these different basic blocks. Now, of course, the compiler will evenly space these out. Uh, I didn't because I'm not perfect at drawing in this black environment, although I could just do this. There we go. So we have the four basic blocks here, and we're going to implement the actual um, code for them. So, for example, if we take a look in main, our first instruction is input a number. Uh, and so how do we input a number? We click on this color over here, so we input a number. And then after that, we want to duplicate uh, the current number on the stack. So I'm going to click the duplicate color, put that down. We want to push a 2 to the stack. So we actually want two of these codals so that I can run a push operation. Now we've got two on the stack. Then I want to run a modulus operation. So I'm going to run that. And then I want to conditional jump based off of the value that's on the top of the stack. Uh, now, the conditional jump, the way we're going to implement that is by using the switch instruction. So we're just going to do this. 
um, and then we're going to make it so that uh, the compiler can can sort of jump based off of uh, this. And so this will be out. This will be one of our branches, and this will be one of our branches that can continue off here and then wire into other basic blocks. The beginning of every basic block must be a white. Um, block. And so just like this, we want the rest of the basic blocks to also be filled out here. And then we're going to have separate logic that comes in, takes a look at these basic blocks, and implements the wiring between them such that the program does what we want it to do. Does that make it sense? Anything you want to add there, Omer? Uh, one thing I just want to note that uh, the starting point is always at zero, zero. So we just got to connect it from that exact point. Totally. And so, like, for example, if this was the first basic block, this is the main basic block, then what we want to do is start off and actually put in a little bit of color to make it move over here in the first place. But it's important to have this white spacing, because if you don't have this white spacing, this sort of movement, this wiring codal, would be considered as part of the initial codal, which can be bad if you're doing something like a push operation. Uh, then you would be pushing a bunch of like wiring into the stack, which is completely unnecessary. Um, but by doing this, we're forcing um, P it to move where we want it to move. So. How about we get started with actually implementing the solution? So, Omar, where do you think, what do you think we need to do next to get um, these basic blocks rendering? Uh, we don't have any of the colors right now. So, yeah, I, guess, and that's I feel the very like that's first a good thing we need step. to do. You're yeah. right. And the relationship to them, even to like, a, say, in text, and then we can convert it into code afterwards. Exactly. You're right. So let's go ahead and search a P at language. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the official language uh, of the official web page for P it, um, which I'm not sure where it is. But... <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, um, but the, essentially what we're trying to do, there we go. Okay, so this is sort of the, um, the, the sort of map of different colors, the standard colors. Um, you know, you could technically use any colors because of the fact that it works off of the difference between them, uh, but we're just going to use the standard ones. Um, so, Omar, do you want to show me how we would turn move these hex codes into, into Go? So I'm thinking yeah. the way we could represent this in memory would be we just have this list of different colors, and then there's also um, over here there's like a list of... Uh, what, what is it? it? There's a list of how many hues darker uh, it, something needs to be to actually run an instruction. Uh, is that here or is it? Yeah, there we go. So based off of the lightness change and the hue change, we can determine what instruction to run. Um, so do you know how to calculate things like the lightness change and the hue change? Uh, no, I guess and that's something we got to learn. All right. Uh, what learn do we that. mean by one step, two step, or one doctor and two doctor? Is there like so, some ratio? Yeah, basically, like if the color between codal 1 to codal 2 gets one darker and one step in hue change, then we're going to run a subtract operation. I don't know what exactly darker or step means. I guess we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, the thing is, do you, do you want to just do a relationship between this color and the operation, and that will give you the color for it? Or do you actually want to compute uh, this the graph? So we could compute this, or we could just like take a look at this and note down every operation, but I feel like that would take a lot longer than we want it to. This is a brutal well, let, uh, Let's task. just see. Uh, calculate lightness change with RGB. Can we do that? Oh. Well, that would be for perceived brightness, not actual lightness, I feel yeah. like. Only to determine brightness of RGB. What's the what's HSL stand for for color? HSL color. Oh, okay. That's exactly what we want. Cool. We just convert RGB to HSL, and then we can do a simple subtraction between the two HSL values, and we would have what we need. Okay. So let's actually try that out and run through that. So if we take a look at light red to red, right? And if we were to convert those to HSLs, let's see you if, uh, online, if you want. Uh, yeah, but I feel like we should do it online first just to make sure it works. Okay, let's get the formula. Oh. Yeah, so let's get the HSL for the values. Um, well, of course, it's <laughs> 255. We want to do hex to HSL <laughs> because they didn't give us oh, RGB. All right, so 
FFC0C0. All right. So it's so, zero. There, the age of cell is 088. Well, we don't care about saturation. We only care about hue and lightness. So it's 088. Okay. Um, so I'm going to note that down over here. So we have 088 um, for, for our light red. And then our other red is 050. So that's 050. And the operation that it runs, if I actually check that out against our gold standard here, is push. So let's go ahead and check out what push means here. That means it's one darker and no hue change. Okay. So that makes sense. That makes sense because the, the hue was the same. But then we went from 88 to 50 for lightness. So does that so mean... Can we go to the next step, uh, the one below it? Sure, but my prediction is that 38, 38 individual changes in L value would count as one darker or two darker. Let's let's com let's make sure that's the case for the second one. Sure. Can so let's see what the pop instruction is then. Pop is that dark red. And so if we take the dark red over here and if we paste that into here, 38. Well, not exactly because now 50 minus 38, that's only 12. Yeah. How does that make sense? <laughs> well, maybe this is standard across colors. So let's actually see. So 88 to 50 to 38 is my next. Yeah, so it's yeah. standard. So we can hard code the lightness values and hard code the hue values. Um, and that should help us figure out what we need to do. Okay. Can I also want to make a, I want to check something. Can you go back to the online interpreter? Yep. Click on uh, pop. Okay, can we go back to the diagram for the conversion? Um, so, a p was it a push, right? Or yep. was it... No, like when we clicked, we clicked on pop. We click on pop, and what was the first uh, instruction again? Can we go back? I kind of forgot. Push, okay. Uh, push is just one darker. I thought it would be two darker in that case. Hmm. Well, the what thing is, is... What is going to be... Uh, can we go back? I want to see the one between the two. Which is pop. And can we go back to the exact example? And the pop is two darker. Maybe when huh? you're going the other way, it reverses. <laughs> oh my god. That's annoying. So I feel like what's happening is um, when you're going from a darker color to a lighter color, then it negates the one darker and two darker. So if it's actually one lighter, then you're running this operation. And if it's two lighter, then you're running this operation. That might be the case for the QSO then. Is it? How do let's we try check to... that? That's a bit more confusing to check, but let's see. Let's do an add. Uh, so let's go from the first color. To so light this color one. to light yellow. Um, yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. And then two darker, three darker, four darker, five darker. Okay. Wait, maybe? You know what we could just do? I don't think we even need to hard put all these colors. We could just have this as an array of values and just make it so that we like shift the values. See, they're just shifting by one. Yeah, you're all right. We could have that. it as like a sliding belt in two dimensions. This would be a lot easier to do in Python, by the way. <laughs> we saw what happened last uh, two weeks ago with Python and PyTorch. <laughs> oh yeah, two weeks ago, the PyTorch episode, that was... Uh... Yeah. It's, anyway, um, so yeah, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of how to implement this. Can but we, I'm gonna can need. You go, can you click on the last? Uh, can you click on end? Uh, counter. Uh, which one? End counter. Uh, why about the top one? This one. Yeah, uh, one up. This one. Yeah. Okay. I just want to check something. Evidence. Yeah. Left. So I feel like it's just sliding across and left and right and up and down whenever we move things. Yeah. So, a way that we could calculate colors would be, oh, sorry, no, I don't want to go to a website, um, is 
uh, where do we want to put this code, by the way? Do we want to put it in main.go or render? No, we want to put it in main.go. Yeah, just for main. We're just going to dump everything here for now. Yeah. And then we'll split it up and modularize it in a bit. Yeah. Uh, so we have the instruction validators. Now what we want to do is we want to have the color matrix, or actually the instruction matrix. We don't, yeah, we only care about the colors. We can just apply it on top. So if we want to have a two-dimensional array of um, integers, let's just call them. Okay. Is that valid? Like, can I do this? Yeah, that's valid. And then can I do this? Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's also valid. You just forgot the comma at the end. Oh, okay. So go forces you to have a comma at the end. Yeah. All right. Um, so... Yeah, so we want... have, so we're we're basically just gonna number these from one to however many there are. Do we actually want to make types for these? Or... I don't think we need to yet. At least let's just test out the transition logic first, and then. Okay. I feel like we should start from zero, so that we can um, count the one that's currently selected. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Wait, did I put in the right number there? No, that's and seven. And then you have nineteen almost. and twenty. Yeah. Well, let's not count those. Those are going to be just yeah. standard because those never move around. Um, and then what we could do is we could have a mapping. Um. Quite a fun at the moment. To, well, I feel like it would be better to have a map because sure. that's we can query that easier. I feel like uh, map int to string. So, what my idea is with this is that we could have um, so like zero currently would be um, we can call that wire ink uh, and then our like one well let's just see one would be plus right and then two would be slash or divide well, i'm just putting the character name down um and then we would just keep doing that so we have greater and then we have duplicate. uh duplicate yeah can you actually keep giving me those things. Oh, you don't have it open on your screen. Do you? I don't have it open. <laughs> okay, so then in character. Just post a link and I can just give it to you. You yeah, can just sure. post in the, uh, the VS code and I can just copy it. Uh, I'll slack it to you. Okay. Um, because that way, just search up um, P at IDE Gabriel. No, I, I mean, you can literally paste it in the, I, uh, the text editor. Oh, like this text? Yeah, just face it. I'll just I, go through it quickly. Oh, yeah. Actually, you're right. I Have can't seen select it? this, though. I mean... Good idea. Okay, so input character. Six would be push. Seven would be subtract. Or, and just to keep it standard, I'll make this add. Eight would be modulus, nine would be pointer, ten would be roll, um, twelve, uh, eleven would be output number, twelve would be pop, thirteen would be multiply, then fourteen would be not, fifteen would be switch, not which, switch. 16 would be input number. How did I put in the other? Okay, so input number. 17 would be uh, output character. 18 would, well, that's it, I believe. Yeah, 17 is the end. Okay, so then what we could do is we could just calculate that if zero were to move to a different index, how would the other indices move? And then we could simply query this to figure out what the instructions are. 
let's let's do a test then. If we yeah. put the pointer on add, does it adjust it correctly? Sure. Um, so so let's actually do that. Um, so for that, I'm going to create a function move. Oh shift, I guess. Instruction. Or instructions Set. at location. Uh, and then we get a location, so uh, x, y. And then we return an array of an array of strings. Does that make sense? Why are we turning an array of an array of strings? To We're not tell you what. Anything? I mean, yeah, we could just return the integers. That makes sense. Because uh, we'll be working with integers anyways. We don't really yeah. care about the string. That makes sense. All right, yeah, and we can just query this whenever we need the string version. Yeah. OK. We can just delete this. We don't need that anymore. Uh, so what we can do. I'm just trying to think of the best logic to actually convert or, or to move. So let's just let's deal with x first. So if x is at zero, then nothing moves. But if x is one, then we pop from the end and push to the beginning. So what we can do we is do, but we do it for all the x, right? I guess. Yeah, for for all we of gotta, them. We, yeah, we gotta assume that these are a block. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's do that. So for let me just clean up so the output would just be that that test. Is this valid Go code? Uh, once one sec. I haven't used another thing that I want uh, everyone watching the live stream to realize is that I've barely coded in Go before, which is which, but but still, I'm we're going to be implementing a compiler in Go, so it should really get across the point that you don't need to know a programming language to implement logic. Logic is generic and can be applied across languages, yes. and I, I just know what I need to put in, and I just need to ask for how it's done in Go. That's it. He's so, Stack Overflow. So. Is this valid in Python, first of all? Is this valid in Python? What do you mean? If if you just like do uh, say a range in Python, will be will this be valid? Yeah, so like in Python I could do Python for i in range three and I yeah, could so, do print i. Yeah, but range we turn a list. Yeah. Range in Golang assumed a list was there. Ah, okay, then how do you create a list? So you just want to go over three? Yeah. Uh, you can do it just like C and... and oh, you would have to do a C style loop? Okay, then that's... Yeah, so... Yeah. Okay, well... Less than three? Yeah. All right. So... Just remember, uh, if you don't know something in Golang, just assume it's like C or Java. Oh, Most okay. likely it will work out. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, it did in this case, so yeah. <laughs> no, no, you you assume in Python, okay? Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, range you define as like the way you see yeah. Python. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna loop through three, and first we're gonna shift based off of x. So uh, so for uh, x shift zero, x shift less than x. Uh, x shift plus plus. What this is going to do is if it's zero, this will not iterate at all. Um, but if it's not, then it will. Um, so, what is the first one for? The first one. This is to go through every row. Oh, uh, I just use it called y. Oh uh, well. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean it makes more sense actually to call it y. But we already defined y. So uh. Oh yeah. Y or, index, I'm guessing. Yeah, Y index makes sense then. Okay, so uh, so in in Go, uh, so let me just tell you quickly. In Swift, an array is a value type, not a reference type. Oh, Omer, you're gone. 
Um, but there we go. Uh, so in Swift, an array is a value type, not a reference type. So if you were to have like a global array, and then if you were to, you know, call it back in a, or create, a, or if you were to have a global constant and then create the new variable within a function referring to the old one and modify, it would modify a copy. Um, in Swift or in Go, is an array a reference or a value type? Um, by default, uh, you can do it by reference, but okay. So when you, you want to change it, uh, yeah. it would just be a copy. You like okay. when we kind of. So we want to make a copy of this so we can modify it in this function. Can you do that? Yeah, we can do that. Oh, also, right. while you implement the copier, uh, another function, another question is writing a parser is very difficult. Are you using a parse tree? Uh, so the, the language that we've sort of built for this, the, the assembly type language, doesn't require complex parsing uh, because it's just so simple. Um, and so that the entire goal of this episode today is that we implement the compiler and not the parser because the parser is just difficult to deal with, not because it's logically complex, but rather because there's thousands of different ways to represent the same, you know, set of code or instructions. Um, and so we're, we're going to, we're going to be using just like a, a um, what do you call it? We're going to be using a simple enough language that we don't require a complex parser. Also, uh, you said deep copy, not shallow. In this case, it shouldn't require a deep copy because no. the values are value types, integers. Oh, wait, no, the values are reference types, arrays. So we would so need to... So the thing is, we're gonna do everything with slices anyway. So we show you, we don't really need to copy it because when we up when we create the slice, it just does a copy of it anyways. It doesn't really change uh, the structure because we're gonna call, we turn a different a variable. Sure, actually, you're right. Now that I think about it, I was gonna do this the less efficient way. Um, Okay, now you're thinking about uh, C and Java a little too much now, not <laughs> Python. <laughs> Come on, you can at least do it like in Swift as well, the same exact way. Just then. Is this a valid way to create a new array? Uh, or have I you messed up the syntax? Syntax. Don't worry, I will fix it. Do we need to use like a make? Yeah, integer, of course, but is this like valid? Oh, it's declared. Okay, so it's valid. It's just saying it's declared but not used. Okay, I'm fine yeah. with that. Um, that's the one thing that's very annoying for Go for people that are on it is that if you don't if you don't use a variable, it's gonna complain and it will not let you compile. Really? Well, yeah. Swift is strict about it. It'll give you really useful warnings, but it's not gonna prevent you from compiling. No, GoLang is like uh, unless there might be a flag today, so it, but it'd be like no, it's not gonna work. Interesting. Very strict, I see. But that's a good thing, kind of. Uh, okay, so what we want to do is probably just append to this and at the same time set. So append to this. Um, well, in that case, we wouldn't need X shift because now I'm thinking we can just do slicing. Yeah. Uh, so then we would just do, uh, we would need to take a look at the old instruction matrix. The tennis, what are we... And then y index one second, thinking about logic, and we would just do x to the end. Is this valid? Can I do x to negative one? I wish I was valid. <laughs> What's well, not. not valid about this? We we went we went to this. It was not how, valid. Why? How do you go to the end? How do you go to the end? You get you get the link. Okay, this Seriously. is the one that I'm I'm not a big fan of, but okay. Well, we'll just type six then. I'm not a big fan of it, okay? Oh, do you want to go to the very end? Or do you uh, want the last one before it? No, we want to go to the end. Okay, six is fine. Um, well, no, we, we want to go see. to the end we'll... minus six minus x. Okay, we, so, we will see when we do it. Six okay, minus like... x, that, that's going to be valid. Why? So, for example, if x is 2, um, oh, then we yes. would 6 minus 2, so we want 4, and then we want to take pre the last ones after that and move that to the beginning. But the logic doesn't work then. Yeah, I feel like we're going to we, have we an need, off we, by we, one we, error somewhere. Let's just make this into 6. But like, like that's it, not going to work, though. Because if x is 5, 
you're trying to go from range five to one, which doesn't work. Like you're when right. you do when you do a range, you always have to be a greater number on the other side. That makes sense, but then maybe what we would want to do is do x plus six minus x. Can we just try this and see what happens? Sure. I feel like I feel like we we might be overthinking this. No, I don't think we are because let, the let me just call, be x, right? Let so me just call be... this. Let me just call this function so we can at least see something. Sure. So and we're assuming return, zero zero. And let's just return uh, this. Yeah, this this is not formatted the best way for sure. Yeah, that's fine. It's fine now. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. One sec. Uh, oh. I'm just I mean, gonna do an ID array, okay? Sure. I just pent out M. Oh, you want to run it? Okay, let me give you access. Okay. Oh, nice. Uh, what, what is the issue now? Can I use... One, four. Can I use... Oh, we have to um, add to the array and not append an array to the array. How do you do that in Go? Well, we could just technically do this for now. I guess. No, I thought we want to pen to the array, don't we? No, we want yeah. to set it. Uh, okay. okay, do you save it? Yep. Test declared. <laughs> this is what you were talking about, weren't you? Yeah. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, this, this is the way to fix it, don't worry. Oh, okay. You just put, set it to... Makes sense. <laughs> Why? Did I mess up the function? Yeah, I did. Okay. That's good now. Okay. So, zero, so one, So it's just two. copying it. Yeah. Which is fine. That seemed to be fine. Now, let's just say, let's let's ignore at Y for now. Let's, one sec. Let's only take a look at X. And let's just say we move X to two. Or just mm -hmm. one, right? Now yeah. we've got to implement the X shifting logic. Right now, so, if I save and run, it's just going to still copy. Oh, oh, there we go. See, this is exactly what I was talking about. So it copies up from, from, from there to the end. Um, so what is going to be before again? Uh, so we're at... Uh... Well, no. So here, so here's the That's thing. Incorrect. Yeah, that is actually incorrect. We want to go from 0 to 4 in the beginning, not 1 to 5. Wait, because why do then you want 5 would come back to the beginning. No, but... Okay, let's go back to the diagram again, online. Yeah. Okay, no, no, this image. So if we go to the plus, which we... Currently at. See, the 5 comes back to the beginning. So the 5 come back to the beginning? But yeah. we also need to make sure that the 0 is in the 1 position, which is not. Well, and the way 0 will be in the 1 position is if we get this slice, and then we insert this in the beginning, 0 automatically becomes in the 1 position. Okay, can we go back and let's, let's see if that's the case? Uh, we have, no, but there's only 6, there's 6 numbers in total, and we're only displaying 5. Yeah, and the problem is that, and, and that's exactly the problem. We want to still show 5, but we don't want to show 1 to 5. We want to show 0 to 4. Right? No. Oh. Like, basically, what I'm saying is we want to go from the beginning oh, to... But, okay, let, 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 just, let, let me just type this out and tell me if, if this is the assumption. So we want to go from this... To uh, five here and then a zero here. I yeah, mean, sorry, and then six. the five gets removed at the end. Six. Well, no, a five because the final one's five. Yeah, it's so zero we again. want this to happen. Yes, yes. And the easiest way to do that is to get this slice and then whatever, whatever is after the slice, remove that and put it in the beginning. Uh, that's why you did the minus one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so then, what we. In order to get that initial slice, we could do the six minus x thing over here, which, if I run it, is correct. Yes, and then and then, and then we also want to get from uh, x to the n. Yeah. So then no, we could do okay. six minus x to um, to six basically, and yeah. that would be in. 
here. Oh, do we want to do? Okay, we can give that a try. Uh, we need to append this, by the way. Yeah. Well, we need to insert it. So, can we do this? Look. Because this is an array, we can't append it. What are you talking about? Why you can't not? append an array to an array. You have to insert the values. No, you can always append it. Because it's in not Swift a... and Python, you can't. Unless in Go, append means something else. Append just means to add to the list. Okay, so look at my screen. Like, if we have a Python list called L, and we mm -hmm. do L.append123, L is two-dimensional array now. But if mm -hmm. we do L plus equals 123, L is still one-dimensional. Yes, we can still do the same thing. Yeah, and how do you do this plus equals thing in Go? Yeah, it's still append. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, so which one does need to be in the beginning, right? Yeah. One sec. Oh, so you can concatenate two arrays by appending them to each other. Uh, one sec. I forgot the syntax. One sec. Uh, not necessarily. We're going to unravel it. So oh, unravel it. We have a, a, uh, a lot of variables, OK? OK, OK, OK. How you do it. OK, so kind of like the star in Python. Yes. OK. That makes sense. There we go. Hooray. All right. So uh, I guess we're done for the day. <laughs> we still got an hour and six minutes. All right. So now if we test that with a higher x value. Nice. OK. So okay, we've let's got one see step if down. we do it to six. See what happens. Let's do five, like the max. What? The changes oh, to five, five and see if everything which is work. Very good. Yep. Okay. Now let's deal with the uh, Y shifting, which is going to be a bit more mind bending because. Yeah. No, can you do like a two, Can you do like a two D slice and go? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that's that. that's the thing. You can't implement a two D slice and go easily. Wait, why do we really care? Because the thing is, we have the X, right? Can we not just yeah. shuffle them? Shuffle. Okay, let's go. Let's go back to the example. Oh wait, actually, you gave me a good idea. Like, <laughs> so all we would really need to do is um is change the ordering of the Y index based off of the Y value, and then it'll it'll automatically deal with that for us. <laughs> Unnecessary. Let's give it a try. No, so like basically all we would do is do um, y index is equal to y index minus y or something of that sort. I feel like this is not the right logic, but something on those lines. And it should work. Let's give it a try. Actually, well, it works in, when it's zero, of course, but then when you make it one, I don't think it's going to work. I know what's going to happen. Let's, let me show it's you. It's going to be like negative one, and then it's going to... No. Oh. What? I didn't do anything. Or, oh, no, you didn't save it. Oh. There we go. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. It's like, what? You book, you book, you book the compiler. <laughs> let's do this. No, no, let's do this. Let's do this. Let me show you. Let's do this. I don't think we should do it that way. Well, I think not working. Did we not pass enough arguments? Oh yeah. Okay. The, the reason is not. It's gonna skip one entire row now. No. Yeah. Which is. Uh, did we save this? Which is fine. We can add it back in. Okay. I feel like this is taking a little. This is taking a little too long. Oh. Oh. What? Oh, because it's an infinite loop. <laughs> C loops are just. Okay, I, I don't think we should change all the indices because this logic is flawed anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah all we that. really need to do is just put the, the other one on the bottom. Technically, it'll work. Well, not exactly, I think. 
one and off? One sec, one sec. I just want to quickly... By the way, you didn't change the other Y indices. You only changed two of them. What's other Y? Oh. This one. No, no that Oops. one's fine. No, no, that, that's, that's one's fine. Keep the original Y index? Yeah. We're going to mess up if you don't have that. Okay, you're right, actually. Um, so we got to do two things, which would be, by default, do this. So that we have three arrays, so we don't need to append. Oops, sorry, no, I just deleted the whole thing. Um, delete that append. And then one more thing that I want to do is if it's less than zero, uh, then wrap it around. So y index 2 equals 3 minus y index 2 and 3 minus negative 1. Oops, nope, sorry, no, 3 plus y index 2. Then 3 plus negative yeah, 2. Okay, let's try that out. But won't this just give the exact same thing? No. There we go. Huh. That works. Yep. Uh, and let me let's see if that's actually correct though. I don't think it is. I think we I think we shuffled it twice actually. Okay, um, let's let's go back to the diagram and see if it's correct. Are you in the diagram? Wait, sorry? Are oh, you gonna show diagram? The Okay, so click on push. So like if we move to one, we want that one in the middle. Ah. Like we want the seven on the top and then the 14 on the bottom and then, or do we so, want that way? No, so wait. We so want click to move on the very bottom one at the top. Which, oh, we like are, we but want... okay, okay, go back. So I feel like, yeah, we literally just need to insert the last one into the middle. Is that okay. the case? Or no, that... no, that's, uh, look, let's, let's first of all erase this logic because it's kind of messing things up a little bit. Uh, and let's just verify once again that it still works and we didn't fundamentally change Point our logic. Ahead. Okay, good. Okay, so let's do this. Once uh, I, yeah. Let's just deal with the Y axis. So we want to, let's just do uh, like uh, in text what we actually want the outcome to be so we have something sure to but i feel like just so that you know a super naive way to do this just so that you understand how i'm thinking about it would be if we were to create an array called new y and if it were to have zero one two right uh mm -hmm. and then we were to do four i equals and we're gonna make this code a lot cleaner just i want to um get this down before i forget um, new y uh, equals append new y from 1 to 3 with um, in new y, well, no, sorry, 0, 2, new y, 2. And, and then uh, new instruction matrix two <laughs> again definitely not the best way to do it but I feel like it would work at least would be to create a new version of this and then just do um, for I uh, for index I am range new y new instruction matrix two i equals um new instruction matrix index and then return two let's see if that works did i pass it a one i pass it a one basically what i want to do is i want to wrap this two around to the beginning and um, is that is that what's happening here? Uh, how do you print in your like that? Is that how you print in Go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Oh yeah. So zero um, one two, which is incorrect. Yeah, we want it to be. Um, oh yeah, because we're appending, not inserting, of course. Uh, how do you append to the beginning of an array? the other way around or so, or 
just to make it easy. Yeah, just do that. What are you doing? Yeah, I guess. Technically, it works. Technically, it worked, you know. This technique doesn't work anymore. It technically doesn't work. <laughs> uh, oh, did it? I think I didn't save the code before I ran it. It might have not saved. There we go. Okay, there we go. It worked now. Uh, well, it still technically didn't work. Um, because I split these over. We want index and I over here. There we go. So that's okay. that's exactly the logic that we want. I'm back. So do you want to go ahead and make this more Go-like and something that you would actually do in Go? <laughs> uh, I feel like at this moment, might as well just, you know what? I would do it. Sure. I, I, I want to see that logic. Let's see if you can uh, do this. I don't want to do it right now. Uh, give, give me a few minutes. Sure. I mean, if, if you don't, if, if it's too difficult to convert this... Um... No, no, I, I just I just need to make sure that the code is correct, so I just gotta quickly... Double yeah, check that's the only thing. You gotta make sure it's logically correct, of course. Mm-hmm. Someone's asking if they can try and figure out the logic. I mean, sure, if you have any ideas, feel free to put them in the chat and we can uh, I don't we can take a look at them. Yeah. Uh, or if you want to go to this website called Repolit and you want to implement it for yourself, um, then sure. Uh, I, I would love to take a look at the logic that you write, for sure. So, Tammy, uh, you sure start working on the other components, and then I will just figure it out. Sure, and then just quickly check. So if we move zero here, then 13 comes to the very top left, and 13 should be multiply. Yes, okay, so our logic works. That's amazing. Okay, that's good. You know, technically, instead of going through all this logic, we literally could have just written down the actual colors themselves. But I feel like this was a worthwhile uh, spend of time. Uh, it might have been probably faster just to do it this way. Yeah. So uh, it's no really way of doing this. Yeah. All right. So go ahead and you can work on go -izing this code. Are you creating a new type for this? Yeah. Uh, just going to make sure that we don't have this type defined yet. Sure. What's the type going to do? It's going to just hold what the value is going to be. So we can just say this is a wire. This is a add, divide. So we don't really need to worry about this anymore. All right. Um, yeah. But so, again, we can just leave it like this. It's fine. We can just do like a C approach and just brute force everything. Yeah, I feel like this is a pretty, pretty okay thing. Yeah, this is okay for now. Uh, the one thing I do want to know, I do need to do is uh, the color reference. Like what is zero, what is one? So can you paste that link uh, that show all the colors? So sure. Create them. Uh, where'd it go? Like the actual hex codes. Yeah, you can also just copy the link and send it to me if that's possible. Yeah, I can just screen. Well, I don't want to screenshot it. Then, then, then I you gotta manually I... write it. <laughs> Come okay. on, that doesn't I'll, help me any then. I'll, I'll pass you the link. There we go. Okay, so we've got a, at least the um, the wiring, like what index goes where. That's one challenge out of the way. Yeah. Uh, now let's work on the next challenge. So the next challenge is to build the actual basic blocks. We're getting 
a lot further along than I thought we would be. So that's good. So you go ahead and work on that function. I'll work on this function, and we'll sync up after after I finish this one. So. Yeah, I'm just gonna be a mute for a few minutes. Sure. Okay, so I've got to implement a function that takes a block of instructions and implements, um, and, and so it implements a PIT valid runnable version of that block uh, using these over here. Uh, for that, we're going to need to transpile um, or compile, I guess, our language spec to raw p it. Um, for that to happen, I'm going to choose some of the instructions that I'm going to work on first. So input, output, for sure. These ones are easy because those are just a one-to-one -one correspondence. Push is also easy. Uh, pop is easy, not is easy, greater is easy, jump and conditional jump, not yet. And then duplicate is also easy. So I'm going to implement these instructions. Uh, for that to happen, I guess we'll just do it the regular way and have a function that says instructions to basic block. Uh, and we're going to take an array of instructions and we're going to call this instructions. And it's going to return an array of integers. Yeah, it's going to return an array of integers. This will eventually need to be a multi-dimensional array although I'm sure that we could just start off with a single dimensional array and then expand it as we need to. Yeah, let's do that. Well, just so that we don't have too much difficulty eventually in the future, I'm going to make this two dimensional right now. Um, and then we're going to initialize the space with a bunch of... Also, for this map, the negative one is going to be black or negative two can be black. Wow, well, like no, it just make eighteen nineteen to be. Well, yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah, eighteen like... white, nineteen black. All right. Yeah, thank you. So that goes over there, and then we want to initialize a bunch of nineteens. So I guess we'll do it manually. No. You know, I, you know, I'm debating if I should make a function to convert uh, instruction to X or just literally use the, the thing above and just like, okay, here's the X code, the map that we defined for the string. Honestly, there's no need to have an entire function if the function yeah. is just a switch. Just use a map. Yeah, just use a map. Yeah, just I'm use like, a map. Yeah, let's just copy and paste the top one. Uh, X. We can fix names later. Yep. By the way, another question. The question is, what is the project about? I thought you're trying to implement the PIT compiler. Um, are you trying to make your own language and transpile the PIT? So yeah, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to take PIT code and actually run the p code with our program. What we're trying to do um, is we're trying to take our own language, which is a slightly higher level language, and convert that to p images. And then we can feed those p images into any interpreter and run them. But for now, we want to take our language and convert it to p images. So um, instructions to basic block. Um, basic block would be a new array of integers and I'm going to initialize these with a bunch of like well we don't need to initialize let's just do an append so for i 0 i less than len instructions i plus plus so we're going to loop through instructions and we're going to have to append to basic block based off of what the instructions are. And the basic block is going to start off with what I call a wiring color, and that wiring color is going to be zero. Uh, and let me see what I put in for zero. 
uh, okay, wiring, yeah, good. Um, so then, but then when we move around the zero, then that becomes the new wiring block. Well, that is like, what we want. What? I feel like I got the teaser job ever. Like, like I have to copy and paste the color <laughs> 16, 20 times, man. <laughs> Well, it's fine. Oh, I just want to test something. Can you open up the test.png? I just want to make sure that you're able to see it. Sure. Uh, no, no, no go, go back. No, go back to VS Code. Do you see the oh, last this? one? Yeah. An error occurred while loading the image. Uh, okay, I guess you will not be able to see it then. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, but... when we get to the image, we can just show my screen then. What I could do is from your terminal export it to base64 and then uh, decode no, base64. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Can we actually, no, can you go click on it again? I just want to quickly test something. Uh, the test of PNG? Yeah. Can you just click on open file? Yeah. So I'm guessing it's only able to do binary. Oh, okay, that's right. It doesn't understand it. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. We worry about it later. Okay. Uh, so, another question is, what are the tokens and keywords of your custom language? These are the different instructions in our language. It's going to be very assembly-like. Uh, it's going to be super low level, but a little bit of high level functionality, like for example, being able to output and push strings onto the stack, which is really just going to push a null terminator and then all the characters in reverse order, so that when you want to print it out, we can pop, 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 pop until we hit a null terminator um, and then output. Uh, so, all right. That's our language spec. If you want to pause there to take a look and understand the instructions, you can do that, but uh, let's continue from there. So in order to build a basic block, uh, what we want to do is, first of all, push would have to have a little bit of special functionality. Um, that's for sure. So we want to start off with zero, which is just a wire in color. But we want to start off with white, technically, so 18, zero. And then we want to be, oh, are you modifying things on my function over? Which one? No, I'm not. Never mind. Not okay. Things got removed somehow, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, so we want to start off with white and then wiring, which is just that very light red. And then from there, we want to take every instruction and append. If it's a push instruction, then we want to repeat the previous instruction as many times as we need to push. Yep. Let's go so ahead and do that. In this case, I'm guessing uh, the light red can just be repeatedly added. Because that's what you need to be. Oh, uh, one thing. One thing I do want to know. Uh, maybe we can test this theory out on the website. Does it always have to be a straight line, or yeah, does it always have to be a straight line for it to be considered a number, or can it just be like an object? No, it can be an object. Uh, so, like for example, I could create like a cube or like a circle, and that would be a valid block. Um, and so that like can be considered a number, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like for example, I could do. And then I could push like that, and then I could output number, and, and that would be should, should print out if I have if my syntax run. correct. I feel like it's an I feel like that's not how it goes. But if we do this, then maybe it works. No, I I think I need to have the red and purple up here. There we go. This will work. Yeah, okay. there we go, I'll swap. But you can have this as any shape. Like I could put these two down here and then it would still work and it would print out like 16 or whatever, yeah. Okay, that might be something that we might consider. Uh, maybe. Once, <laughs> once we get uh, off the ground. Yeah. For now, I'm just doing everything sequentially, like in a single line, just to keep it simple. Which is gonna get a bit obnoxious for long numbers, but... Uh, Yeah, it'll, it'll work. So 
we have the index to instruction, now I just basically have to code in for every instruction. So if instructions i dot name is push number, so that's the first instruction we're going to implement. Uh, maybe I should do a switch statement instead. Uh, yeah, I should do a switch statement, actually. Do Why do we... That. Can we not just work with numbers? But remember, like, the instruction structure has a string. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we need to... Maybe that. maybe we want to convert it. <laughs> no, let's, let's deal with strings. Let's not complicate that right now. Makes sense. Uh, okay, so if it's a push number, then what we want to do is take basic block so length of basic block minus one. So that's that index. And we want to repeat it a certain number of times. And we want to repeat it how many times um, would be instruct we would take the first argument from the push instruction and then we would convert that to an integer which if I can take a look at how we actually do that and go would be strconv yeah, and then ATOI uh, right so and it's all to... error by the way what? it also return an error oh okay yeah well we can be sure that there's no error because we would have, we would have already validated the instruction. Yeah. So yeah, no worry. Uh, so how do you repeat a certain variable a certain number of times to create an array? What do you mean? Like let's just say I have the number one and I want to create an array of a hundred ones. How would I do that? Unlike uh, Python, you gotta do this in the good old uh, Java slash C loop. way. Yes, yes, yeah. you do. Uh, there might be a way, actually. I'm not 100 certain to well, get a, a list of stuff. I hope if there isn't, they at least add it soon. There might be, actually. I need to double check. All right. Um... Yeah, yes, I don't think so. All right. Okay, so I... Uh... Array repeating elements. By the way, Go doesn't happen to have generics, do they? Look, that's the one thing I'm very upset with Go. Like, no generics at all. I wish it does. They have to have generics. I, I, I really want generics. Like, trust me. Yeah. There might be a way to repeat, actually. I mean, if there is, that would be great because there's no generics and I have to copy and paste the same function like for every type that I want to repeat, which in Swift would have just been like a single function. Yeah. Uh... Okay, once I have to look it up a bit more. Sure. You can repeat... Uh... Strings, like bytes away. I mean, I'm not using strings; I'm using integers. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm trying to look.
Okay, so I'm going to pass the main block to this function so that we can um, print out the output just to see what it's outputting right now. Yeah, uh, there's no way I, I could really find. No worries. Um, may, maybe in Golang 2 in a couple years, maybe a, by the time I'm 80, they will probably implement it. <laughs> Some of the downside. Why would it take them that long? Look, they're debating for like, what, 10 years just for generics? No, three years for generics, okay? Really? So I don't know. Or even longer. Because oh. the very first thing people complain is like, how come there's no generic? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm wondering how we would figure out the instruction to number mapping because we know what numbers refer to what instructions, but how do we know what instructions? Um, can we just do the naive way and just do a map and then we can figure this no, like, yeah, totally. I, I agree with that, but like, I'm, I'm just wondering, so like, let's just say we want to get a push instruction, right? And we, we, we know based off of this map that six is push. Yeah. Well, I could, yeah, I could just type the number six there, never mind. You know, what you can technically do, just make a, like a very inefficient loop and just check which index equal this string. Very inefficient, but that's the job. I mean, I feel like I feel like you lost hope in Golang. <laughs> kind of have, but okay. Just let's let's look. Just keep we're, going. We're, we're basically doing something that's not really like we're not even doing anything. Go like okay, we're doing like everything C or something else. Like yeah, you're right. Maybe by the next, because uh, we only have thirty minutes left. Maybe by the next live stream. Yeah. Uh, we will probably clean up uh, some of the stuff to make it more go-like and we'll explain what the difference is. Definitely. Okay, let's go ahead and just run this because I want to see what it does. Oh, well, you're still coding, aren't you? Oh, wait, never mind. I, it was my mistake. Invalid instruction, push end. I wonder why it's an invalid instruction. It should be valid. Uh, oh, uh, is it? No, that's weird. Why is the space didn't, the space didn't get trimmed? Oh, did it not get trimmed? Is it supposed to? Because like, look how much space there is. Yeah, you're right. Oh, space. You're right. Where did our trim go? Our trim is here. Yeah, let's print Once again, technically I could be using breakpoints, but we can also just print. Mm, we can also yeah, print it's it. not it's not trimming the spaces. What's happening? Why is it not trimming spaces? Oh, is, oh, it's because it's a tab, maybe. Do you tap it? Yeah, I tabbed it. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Yay! Oh, that yeah. actually worked. Wow. Okay. So, what it's going to do is it's going to put down an 18 and then five zeros and then five sixes and then another six. Well, so this one's to push and then these five. Well, it's adding an extra six, which it shouldn't be. And it's adding an extra zero, too, because I forgot to do minus one. It's okay. Okay. Now, we should get... Why is it not saving? Are you still typing? Oh, you are, okay. Oh. 229. Oh, I uh, got it. Let me fix this one for you. What's wrong with this? Oh, because it's, it's returning a tuple, okay. <laughs> tell, me, tell me, I don't know what to say anymore. Okay, now the only thing is that we actually have to put in the
colors themselves here because uh, we somehow yeah, have to. I, I'm doing a conversion. So all I really care about is you pass me a list, like how we're going to render it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you can have a 2D array of like 0, 1, up to 20. And I will take that 2D array and convert it to the colors required and then print it out. Okay. So that's the function I'm working on at the top. What I'm going to do right now is just print out the little dot map of the colors. So sure. from light red all the way to dark magenta, just make sure that we, I actually did it correctly and not messed up. Sure. Uh, I keep forgetting that Go uses curly braces for arrays for no reason. It's okay, man. It's okay. Um, so we would have to have a current instruction matrix, which I can initially set to um, instructions instructions at location and then pass it zero zero just to get the initial and then I could continuously change it when I need to um, to do that though huh. we would need to find the index of six within the matrix so okay that makes sense actually um in order to find the index of six within the matrix i'm going to need to create another function because of course we're not doing this in python it's not already built for us um index. what are we trying to do uh, I have to find the index of an element within a 2D array. Look. Nothing is built for you in Golang, man. Unless you want to search like hundreds of repos just to find the one use case. There's not like a lot of standards, really. Yeah. Which is fun when you, you do have the flexibility of a lot of stuff since well, you get full to build it. Yeah, but like sometimes it's too much flexibility. Okay, so I'm basically, I'm basically going to do a two-dimensional loop, so like a loop within a loop, get y and x, and then if this is equal to um, the instruction that we're looking for, then just return uh, y, x, um, and this is going to return, is this how you return a tuple and go, oh, it's not throwing an error, so I feel like One sec, right. one sec, uh, yeah, that's how you do it. Okay. And okay, so that works. Then I can do get me the index of instruction of six within the current instruction matrix. And then pass IDX. And then here's the fun part, current instruction matrix equals instructions at location. And we say our next one is IDX zero, IDX one. And just like that, we should have a program that's able to move across the instruction matrix um, on its own. Now what I can do just to make this even more generic is just say IDX is equal to negative one here or not even negative one just like idx is uh yeah we would want it to be a tuple so we would want it to be let's just say negative one negative one and then in here i could do this and then move this outside of the if statement so that it works for every type of instruction okay so if i run that Ooh, okay, lots of errors, lots and lots of errors. Are you uh, working on something? Yeah, so one of those issues could be mine, but uh, let's try run it again. It shouldn't be my issue anymore. 
Uh, yeah, never mind. One, one of them is my issue. Them. One of them's your issue. One of them is also my issue. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So how do you decree, create a new tuple in Go like this? Uh, you want to actually make a list? What? Uh, like. No, like two. Like there's no tuple type in Go. I have to look it up. I'm not sure. Okay, I don't want to. Really? It's fine. Let's just. Can I there do we it go. Use this? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Uh, well, not really, but you can do this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Yep. And then. All right. Okay, while you're working on I'm going to continue working on mine. Sure. 257. I need uh, Does Go not have type inference? What do you mean by type inference? So like for example, if I just put an array down, will it not infer that the types are integers? Like will I need to specify I'm creating an array of integers now and then pass it the integers? That's yeah, that's fine. Uh All right. well in Swift you would just create the array and it would be like, oh that's an array of integers. No. When it comes to lists, you have, is, you have to type it. Okay, are you going to run a code? Okay, I just removed my item so you can work. Yeah, so mine are uh, really? throwing errors for some reason. Okay, so I don't need to worry about it anymore? Yeah. I need to also fix mine. Because I'm assuming something very stupid. Cannot use array repeating element as type array of array of integers in append. Why is that, I wonder? Uh, which one is that? Did you change array repeating element? No, you didn't. No? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, never mind. I, think I figured it out. I feel like a lot, a lot of pain is just coming from the fact that uh, VS Code is not really the best <laughs> for this stuff. You're right. Okay, there we go. I fixed my issues. Okay. I want to kill this by 10. While you're working on that, I'm going to quickly see what the sort of ground truth would be for the test case that I put together. I just refresh. All right, so I'm going to dump a bunch of black onto here, and then we start off with 0, and 0, and then we push 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, um, so your stuff is working? Uh, I My stuff isn't throwing errors, but I want to test it out now. My stuff is throwing Whenever, errors. Well, well, just you fix yours until then. I'm going to work on the um, yeah. uh, ground truth. Okay, so one. Oops. <laughs> okay, so one, two, three, four, five. So we have five of these. Then we want to push. So one, two, three, four, five. Then we want to push. One, two, three, four, five. Oh no, we only want to push once there. Okay. Uh, so okay. So the values it should give us would be eighteen, eighteen, zero, 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 and then. Zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one and then zero two is what the output of the function should be. I just want to make sure I didn't mess up y and x the ordering, uh, which I did. We want to do x y, not y x, even though sometimes we're doing x y, but don't worry. Uh, so apparently, uh, VS Code thinking uh, a map an index of a map. Oh, never mind. I, I, I see what my mistake is from. What's a GG context? Oh, I, I didn't negate it. Oh, 
Okay, let's see whose code this is scratching at. It's Probably scratching at my. my code. Oh, it's your code. Okay. Oh wait, never mind. It might not be. Oh no, it is my code. It is your code. My code haven't it been is. executed yet. Yeah. Uh, which is first of all, I need to remove these extra prints because they're messing up. Second, but... I, I'm I'm just gonna move mine above here so I can actually uh run my code. <laughs> okay, so I've removed my extra prints. Okay, let's go. That's fine. You wanna run? No, go ahead. All right, so mine is crashing, but yours should work, I guess. No, mine's stupid. In the sense that what? Oh my god! So I made the wrong? most stupidest mistake in my life. Which was? I would train a map as a function. Oh. <laughs> Like I said, the stupid mistake of my life. Is this my code or your code? Uh, it was mine now, it shouldn't. Alright. Okay. And whose code is this? Oh, okay, I see. Okay, that was my code. I, I see what the issue is. If Look, I'm, I'm going to move all my code to the very top because I don't trust this anymore. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. Yeah, no, it was just a little rudimentary issue. All right, I'm good to go. Did you just run that? that? Yeah. Oh. Is that my code or your code? That's my code mine. again. No, nope, it? it's mine. Yeah, I can see the functions that are being called. Okay, so mine is actually being done. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I got the color to work. Did you? That's good. Uh, let me let me just compare the two. Yeah. Okay. So the color has been rendered correctly. Okay. We'll take a look at that in a second. But. Uh... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what now? I. Uh... I. I made a condition to check if we shouldn't execute some code, and I accidentally made it so we only execute the code when that condition is true. <laughs> uh, maybe next week we should do uh, debugging 101. Like, just generally? No, yeah, no, because in general, like, debugging is the most important. Oh, aspect. look at that. It's right. The result is what we expected it to be. Is that zero one two three for me or yours? What? Uh, zero one zero two. I don't know. Oh, that's from my code. It 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 shouldn't come out now. Okay. Nice. Okay, so the very very core of the basic block rendering should work now. Okay, so can you explain what uh eighteen eighteen zero zero like what those 18, two? Eighteen eighteen means white, and zero 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 like zero one zero two, that gives you the x and y value of what color it is that we want to, um, that we want to put on. So for example, zero zero is this over here. Zero one is this. Zero two is this. So can you go back. Eighteen eighteen. I still don't understand that one. I can I get the rest, but eighteen eighteen. Eighteen eighteen is just white, and nineteen nineteen is black. Like those aren't actually X and Y. That's just a placeholder for white and a placeholder for black. Oh, okay, okay. So eventually, this has to be translated to something. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the way we're gonna do that is by using your little um, code. I was assuming I get numbers. <laughs> I didn't know I was literally gonna get the exact. Index. index. Well, we can easily convert the index to the actual one-dimensional index. I mean, there's always this one stack right now? Of... Yeah, sure. There's this one stack overflow post that I go to always to figure that out. Stack overflow 2D index to 1D oh index. My, oh my god. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this... Wait, what? <laughs> Oh, give it a four. Okay, it doesn't care about okay, length. So it should just be row. So x times what? 
No, that's not right. The length times X the height. Times six plus y? I don't feel like that's right. If it's one, if it's two, that would be twelve. So the width time the y plus the x. Just 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 trust me. Okay. Whatever just you say. Me. So let's actually try out one of them. So let's just say zero zero, right? What what was your logic? So the width time the x, I mean the y. Yeah. Plus the width, like I mean, plus the the x. x. Okay. Yeah. So that's obviously that works. But then, if we change y to like one, that gives us six, which is actually correct. And if we move it to two, that gives us twelve. Let's see if twelve is correct. So twelve is over here. Let's go ahead and convert that color. No, it's not correct at all. Oh, maybe. No, wait, 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 wait. Maybe I typed something incorrect. Oh, never mind. It is correct. It I'm is like, correct. I'm like, no, no, you way. are. It's completely correct, actually. Okay. Uh, how we Wait, why is it error? What? Where? This? Oh, how how do we get to five? Test five is declared, but not used. No, I I get I got it now. I was just a little confused. Okay. So can we just okay. do the conversion two D yeah. to one D? I guess. All right. Can you not just give me that exactly? <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm going to do that, actually. Now I'm going to convert this to just this. And then uh, make it so we turn 1D. And also... Wait, uh, 0 is supposed to be black, right? That was 19 is black. 19 is black, yeah. Yeah, but base of block 18, 1, uh, 0. That means... One sec. You know, I let I let you. I I would just see the output and then we can fix it. I don't think this will work. This will probably crash. Never mind. It worked. Is there that correct? Yep. Is it? And eighteen should be white, right? Should be. Yep, it's white, and nineteen is black. Perfect. But you didn't put nine. Oh, yeah, you did. I know, Pink. I know. There is no 19 here because we don't need 19. 19 is when we actually go ahead and stitch the basic blocks together. And this logic does what exactly? Exactly what we did. Uh, this will so out. basically, um, like this logic is not is just gonna push two fives to the stack. So it's gonna push oh. five, push five because I only implemented push. Now, put implementing add and output. Those are trivial now. Those are like two lines of code. Okay, can we can we do this then? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's. Let me do something then. So this is the then I'm gonna get back, right? Yeah, uh, and just convert those to colors by uh, like by querying the map. It should be pretty simple. What are you talking about? Oh, uh, could you? Are we turning? Okay, What's I happening? literally cannot. Add, okay, just okay. Let me let me. Do stuff. Just one sec. Uh, let's do that there. Uh, again, I need this to be. Let's say block one, for example. I'm expecting a two D array. No, you're expecting a one D array. No, but I'm expecting the whole map, right? And then I'm converting no, that. No, you're only converting the indices. You're going to get 18, 0, no, 0, no, no. 0, 0. What, what I mean is that when I render into an image, I'm expecting the whole like 2D array. Oh, like, yeah, totally. Colors. Yeah, like the so final I render, the final render is done that way, yeah. Yeah, so again, I'm just following the final render because that's, that's what I'm doing so far. Sure. Oh, my god. You know, sometimes I really don't like Golang, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> No, because I'm getting confused with so many different uh, approaches. I'm like, okay, never mind. That's how it's supposed to be done. And what is going on? Did I miss about something? Oh, we didn't like it. Where are you coding right now? Main function. Okay. Okay, well, that's because I didn't implement the other ones. I can just ignore the panic for now, or... Can you just wait for like one more minute? I just need to yeah, go ahead. 
else did on this direction is I don't mean just to make sense of what I can do. So, okay, so we have the instruction and then we can just hard code those into here. Well, yeah, and then I'm gonna implement the add function. Are you there's any questions? <laughs> Someone asked, uh, someone's asking, are you doing pointer uh, math? I'm like, no, I don't want to deal with that. Well, I don't think pointer arithmetic is relevant in this use case. Yeah. Because we don't need to do any pointer arithmetic. Oh, someone mentioned Golang is easy to do up APIs. Yep. Yeah. That is right. Is that, the thing is, most languages, as long as you have... Uh, I forgot which framework, uh, Swagger or some other framework similar to that is easy to create a like API endpoint. Isn't Swagger like really annoying to deal with? I feel like someone was telling me that it's not. It is annoying to deal, to deal with. with. Don't get me wrong. Golang in general, like there are a lot of libraries that make your life so much easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to ignore the exit instruction for now by just deleting it. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> exit Anyone? takes some time to implement. All right. Come on, really invalid instruction. Let's see, we only have push add output n, which push add output n, yeah, that shouldn't, that shouldn't cause any issues. Oh, did I not save it before I ran it? This one? Oh, no, you I didn't. You really print out what the instruction is, by the way. Yeah, you're right, in the panic. Do you just do like... Comma? Okay. Yeah, but like if so format it though. Yeah, formats uh, S, P, I can, I'm just going to do it. Yeah, you do it. I don't know what this is. I cannot pronounce this, but whatever. Go. That's print on. Uh, yeah. yeah. Push in. Now push in is failing. What? Wait, why is this? Why is it two space? Oh. Why is there two spaces? Yeah. Actually, no, no, no. That's correct. That's correct. How is that correct? When you when you join. Uh, the oh, it automatically puts a space. Yeah, I I just forgot. That was just typical. Uh, base set arrays logic. Wait, how is push n feeling? I tell you, define push n right here. Yeah, and that should work. That's not good. Zero it's, one. Oh, isn't it valid? it's failing there for no reason. If is this not... is negative one or this is negative one, oh, not equal to negative. Oh, <laughs> it's I the little will... things. There we are go. very. Okay, uh, we are very smart, you know. <laughs> a little too uh, smart, uh, I might say. Uh, is the picture just supposed to be uh, white and then a bunch of uh, light red? Wait, what? Is it actually rendering it? Yeah. Can I see the picture? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me share my screen then. Yeah, you share your screen and I'll switch over for everybody else. Actually, let me stop sharing mine first and then you share yours. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can just show my. Yeah. Can you guys see my? Uh... Okay. Oh my God! I have to let. I have to let Zoom. I have to share my screen. <laughs> oh my voice kind of leaning. Okay, just... I have to rejoin. Okay, I'm gonna rejoin in. Uh, sure. In the meanwhile, like... everybody, we've got nine minutes left. Uh, and remember, the goal for today's session was to get. A, a little compiler that can take simple instructions and convert it to a runnable basic block, something that we can import into the Piet compiler or the Piet interpreter and run. So no like complex conditions and switching and something, just basic, taking a single main basic block, converting it to a set of instructions or a set of uh, pixels, which so far seems like we're nearly there. So my function at the end here is able to output 
the indices of the actual uh, colors that need to be plotted. Um, now it's mostly about getting the right colors for those indices uh, and then being able to plot. So, let's see. Any important questions right now? No questions just yet. In the meanwhile, let's let's wait for Ulrich to come back in. Oh, do I need to let him back in? No, that's just my iPad. All right, we're gonna wait for just a moment more. Let's see. I guess what we can do until then is continue to implement more instructions just so that we can make use of our time. So I can add in like the subtract and multiply. Uh, let's see what the word for that would be. So it would be uh, sub and mul. So sub mul, let's see what I was saying. Oh yes, I have to let it work. There we go. Over should be back. And of course, I'm going to continue to check out where subtract is. Subtract is 7. Okay, so we're going to put in the index 7 here. So how Multiply far did we get? Is uh, I'm just continuing to add more instructions into that little function, uh, but yeah, I was kind of waiting for you to show us the render. Uh, I'm going to show everybody your screen. Yeah, so uh, I'm showing my right. code right now. Can you guys see code? Yep, everybody can see it. Okay, so this is what we render. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look right at all. <laughs> it doesn't look right at all. Maybe, wait, 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 wait. I know why. Silly mistake on my end. I'm pretty sure it's nothing to do with my code because my code is uh, pretty no, no, standard. No. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a six by three image. <laughs> uh, I, I was just about to say, you're probably like assuming some dimensions. I, that, I was just about to say that. Let's wonder this again. <laughs> Let's pretend that never happened. <laughs> Yay. Nice. So I look, I look, I guess somewhat right. Do you want to sure. remove the two rows, like just make it a by one image, and actually pass that to me, and I can try passing that to the interpreter? Because if that works, then we've finished the objective for today's live stream. Okay. Uh, let's do that. Let me just finish. Let me just update the render to only be one. Yeah. So one by uh, ten. Wait. Yeah. Height one with length uh, of block one. Okay, so if I do the test, okay, once we are done completely, we can do the, is this the whole uh, program with the, yeah, the add exit? Do we need well, to it doesn't exit? have exit, but it's fine because we're gonna step through it anyway. Okay, let me just send it to you right now. Slack it you, to me. I am going to Slack it to you. Right maybe, now. I'll, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen, your screen and then. Oh no, I, I'm only sharing, oh, okay. uh, I was only sharing then. Yeah, uh, oh, okay, makes sense. Hold it. Great. Okay, so for the next, uh, we should really figure out how to share images quickly. Yeah, we should. Yeah. All right. Did you send it to me? Uh, you know, I just need to go to it. All right. Okay, send it to you. Great. Let's see your screen. Are you sharing your screen now? Uh, I will share my screen with you. Okay. There we go. And I'll also check if there's any. Oh, oh no, that's that's not ours. Input. Is this like every pixel? Like, is this pick? Is this like one by one for every total? Yeah. Okay, oh good. no, no, it's not one by one. It is, no, uh... it, needs, it needs to be one by one. I can't have it scaled up. Otherwise, it's gonna get confused. Really? Yeah. Can I you can try? Still try. How do you download a Slack image? Is this something? Like... Just download it. I, it doesn't let me down. Oh, there it is. There's the button. <laughs> I, and I, will, I, will, I will scale it down to exactly zero then, like uh, to one side. Yeah, it's I getting it so confused. It thinks, it thinks there's like hundreds of codals. Oh, yeah, give me yeah. one by one. Okay, I'll give you one by one. 
uh, let me run it to you and then copy it to you. Look, it, it's impossible to really see one by one, so I always scale up. Yeah, no, but then remember, once I actually import it into here, each pixel is going to be magnified. Okay. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. God, that is tiny. I can't even click it. <laughs> Holy. Oh, my God. How do you... But you can always do the download on the side. Yeah, like... I got it. I got it. There we go. Oh, what's what's just happened? Did we break the did we break the interpreter? Let's hope we didn't. It'd be like it's too small. There we go. Never there mind. Go. Okay, let's actually see what the debugger says about this. If this runs, I'm gonna be really happy. So we go ahead and run. We start off with Well, looks like it's not doing anything. Isn't that first color supposed to be beige? I that might be the reason why this is happening. Let's try just replacing this. It's going to be slightly be incorrect. Eleven. Okay, there we go. It's working. So we just need to remove the first white, and it should yeah, work. So, so let's do that quickly so we can claim that we finish. Sure. <laughs> but so it does make... Actually, that you change know, you don't, should be simple. You don't really need to do anything because... Uh, just remove the first 18 here. There we go. Now run it, and it should work. Okay. You can you can press them on yourself. Enjoy okay, your so one one less pixel. <laughs> oh, no, this is what I have right. What? what? At least uh -huh. we saved a few bytes. No, I so I so see the white in there. Really? That's impossible. Yeah. Do we save it? Well, let's actually import it and see what it looks like. Oh yeah, you're right. There's still white. Paper. No, no, I, I didn't. I didn't run. Uh, it wasn't rendered correctly. Oh. Like I mean, it wasn't uh, like it, it didn't run run correctly for some reason. There we go. Okay, well rerun it then. Done. No, right. no, no. I already got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and import this in, and with just thirty seconds to go, let's see if this works. So we push five to the stack. Nice. We push another five to the stack. We add and we output. It works. Amazing. <laughs> now we just need to end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the okay. one bit of block. Yeah, so um, I believe with that, we can conclude today's episode of, of live coding. Um, so anything else you want to add to this, Over? Uh, no. It's just Perfect. a pain to work with, uh, like, something live without understanding half the stuff was going on. Yeah, but again, the whole fun of this is that we're doing it live and we can have everybody ask their questions in real time and, and, and answer them as well. Right, and so with that, we... Yeah, sorry, what were you saying? I was going to say, it was most frustrating when we tried to test our code Yeah. and then we both changed it constantly. <laughs> yeah, you're right, you're right. Uh, all right, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. That concludes today's session of live coding. Now, we will be making a few more changes offline to this and just sort of scaling up what we've already done. We won't introduce any, like, you know, brand new logic or anything, but we will be sort of just scaling up what we've already done. Reason being because we don't want to have you just watch us do the same thing that we've been doing for the past two hours again next week. We want to be able to do more stuff. Uh, and so we're probably going to finish a little bit more logic around this. Um, and so that next week we can work on the same project, but, you know, on a, on a larger scale. Uh, so until next time, um, again, thank you very much for, for joining in today. Hope you're all doing well. Really quickly, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see the two of us over here. Uh, now, if you do have any more questions, we will be on for like a couple more minutes, so feel free to put those in the live chat, um, but we will go ahead and continue uh, in the next episode. However, our, our sort of eventual goal uh, is that we should be able to implement like an actual high-level language, and using that high-level language, like, we, we should be able to do something interesting. So um, my sort of eventual goal, this is, uh, I mean, this should, we won't actually end up doing this, but the fact that it's theoretically possible is going to be really fun. Imagine us being able to write a high enough level language where we could write a Go compiler in Piet, and we could bootstrap our own Piet compiler through that. That would be really fun, uh, although way out of the scope of this, in, of this series for now.
And so with that, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. Feel free to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this one. Uh, and if you want to be notified whenever we're doing more live streams like this, every Wednesday at uh, 10 a.m. EST, um, do make sure to turn on the, uh, the, the bell icon, and that way you'll be emailed and notified whenever we're doing another live stream. And so thanks for joining. Omer, anything else you want to say? Um, no, that's everything. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. All right. Bye, guys.